And thanks for joining us. Looks like we have a fair swag of folks tonight, so let's have a little fun. The uh, Mark 19 is a new old regulator that is back on the scene, and it's going to give us an excuse to look back in time at Scuba Pro's offerings, uh, look at the uh, Mark 19 itself, and see uh, how it measures up, and compare it with uh, with some of its competitors uh, in both the Scuba Pro arena and uh, and in uh, other brands. We'll uh, take a look at both balanced and unbalanced, and uh, and then we'll tear down the uh, the Mark 19 and see how it looks inside. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm not a uh, School Pro fanboy. I admire their engineering. Uh, I service their regs. Uh, they were my first reg, but uh, they're good at some things and not as good at other things. So let's just plan to to uh, jump on in with with questions and comments along the way. Uh, as uh, you'll see in the uh, mailing, I asked you to mute yourselves and use the uh, space bar to control your microphone just so that when people have their uh, their screen choice, uh, that doesn't get displaced by whoever is uh, making a little background noise. Alternatively, you can use the uh, single screen that I'm providing here, and I'll try and put the gallery in uh, as we start talking about things uh, so that you don't have to worry what uh, Zoom does automatically. Okay, let's uh, let's take a look at a few things. Well, as uh, you'll gather, uh, everyone is coming out with a diaphragm regulator with a turret. We started with uh, unbalanced regulators and no turret uh, as far back as the uh, Poseidon 300. Uh, that uh, goes back 40 years now, unbalanced. We've gone on to balancing as virtually every other reg has as well. But it seems as though the latest rage is adding a turret. The Mark 19 is not a new regulator. As many of you already know, it was introduced in Europe over a decade ago and was essentially a, a Mark 17 with a, a, a Mark 25 turret stuck on the top of it. And we'll uh, we'll look at that and uh, and compare uh, the two. Before we do, let's let's just take a little minute 
to uh, step back and look at the perennial controversy uh, between the piston guys and the regulator guys. Um, everybody's got an opinion and everybody's right. Uh, but if we look at this from a historical standpoint, diaphragm regulators predated uh, pistons in the, uh, in the mechanical arena uh, by a long shot. Uh, vibrating diaphragm pumps, diaphragm uh, leather valves, uh, all predated the use of, of piston technology. Uh, the supposed advantage of a diaphragm, though, is is a uh, is a sealed mechanism. I mean, even if you take an unsealed reg like this Mars MR22 with an open uh, access to the spring chamber, uh, the spring chamber is is still sealed from the inside of the regulator, still sealed from the mechanism that that contains the valve that's so critical. Uh, when the Mark 25 uh, was introduced. Uh, and followed very shortly thereafter by the TIS, the uh, thermal insulating system. Um, it uh, it still was a bit of a problem with regard to uh, ice resistance. And school employees worked that and worked that and worked that. And now the new Mark 25 Evo uh, is supposedly the the apex for them in that regard. But it's a simple fact that any any regulator that admits uh, uh, seawater through the ambient ports at the same time as the barrel of the regulator is undergoing adiabatic cooling from the tremendous drop in pressure from 3000 PSI to 135 PSI, that, that expansion and, and thermal cooling just generates an ice ball. And what the new uh, Mark 25 Evo does is it, it uh, enhances ice shedding off the spring with its coating. It uses a, 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 an improved, um, squishy washer that cracks the ice as it's forming so that it doesn't bulk up and, and stop the mechanism. But it's a simple fact that if you have the ice inside as well as outside, uh, you're, you're going to have more difficulty controlling ice formation. But the diaphragms uh, are, there, there's a whole legion of diaphragm haters out there, and I was one for 20 years. Uh, when you When you look at one, well, we will in a minute. When you look at one, you got that little tiny hole, and you compare that with a piston or I mean a piston shaft diameter, and uh, there's just there's just no comparison. Uh, how can you expect to have the same amount of flow uh, that you can get down the bore of, uh, of a Mark Twenty Five piston? And and that was the big change, in fact, in in the uh, in the Mark Twenty. The Mark Twenty piston was altered to have an increased internal diameter even further increase uh, airflow. Uh, Kuv, Robert Kuvalon, who's one of our, our participants tonight, will, will be uh, the first to tell you that uh, any regulator that has 27 parts uh, can't be as uh, failure-free as a, as a regulator with one moving part, one piston and a couple of O-rings. And, and he's got a point. And certainly all those parts generate uh, their own costs when it comes to paying for a service kit uh, and uh, forty-five dollar service kits from from Apex is not is not uh, uncommon these days. So it's always been felt to be less robust. And and when we tear this one down tonight, let's see if that's in fact the case. Certainly, uh, Apex has had its problems with regard to their high pressure seat, uh, and uh, there's been a couple of threads on School Border that have talked about that sort of an unexpected uh, high pressure leak. Uh, more often in the high oxygen community, in the in the rebreather community, than amongst air divers, but nonetheless, it's been an issue that Apex has not uh, coughed up to. Uh, although there's evidently been a change in the seat that has made that go away. Finally, the the uh, diaphragm mechanism is is complex enough. Uh, if you've looked at the thread on how to stop an IP creep in a diaphragm, there's there's nine different places where where a diaphragm rig can leak. Um, and then there are people who have said that uh, that uh, at least when a diaphragm is unsealed, it has no better ice resistance than a uh, than a uh, than a piston. Although that that again is a is a spot of great debate. When uh, when I started my career diving uh, scuba pro pistons, the Mark Ten, 
Uh, I was too young for the Mark V, although I've played with them since. But uh, there's a few guys here that uh, started with their Mark V. I, I didn't want to have anything to do with a piston. I mean, with a diaphragm, simply because of what I perceived to be the, the, uh, the poor flow characteristics. Uh, if I wanted to do a big dive, a deep dive with thick air, uh, I wanted to rig with a big hole. That would be a piston. And uh, it wasn't until I saw this study uh, from the uh, Naval Experimental Dive Unit looking at that 1965 um, Poseidon Cyclone uh, with the 300 first stage that we just looked at, that that the light went on. Um, here's a, a rig that hasn't been changed in, in 45 years. It's got a little tiny uh, hole transmitting from the uh, tank area into the intermediate chamber, and half of that hole is taken up by a pin. So the air that you want has got to get around the pin and yet, when you look at its performance uh, at depth using uh, work of breathing as a as a flow for pro as a proxy for flow, uh, because if you're not getting enough flow, you're going to have to you're going to have to suck harder to, to trigger your uh, your second stage. Uh, this rig had no problem going to 300 feet at at modest uh, effort, and when you get into the 62 liter per minute, that is the uh, is the threshold uh, for the CE standard in Europe. Um, this rig still did fine down to 165 feet. So they passed the CE standard uh, 45 years ago. And, and when I saw this study, I, I realized, well, maybe, maybe diaphragms aren't so bad. So, so let's start playing with them and, and seeing what they're like. The Mark 19 uh, looks like a Mark 25. I mean, when you talk to the Scuba Pro guys, that was, that was their aim. The Mark 25 is uh, one of the premier regulators in, in the world. Uh, it, it's so popular, and, and we can debate that because I have some, some strong feelings about the Mark 25. But in any case, it's so popular that uh, to look at the part of the world that says, hey, I, I like diaphragm, so I kind of have something like the Mark 25. They said, here it is. Uh, and the Mark 19, when it was originally released, uh, was released with that in mind. Except that it was bigger. It's it's fatter than a Mark 25. It's heavier than a Mark 25 by 50 50 grams or so. Uh, and uh, and uh, and it never took off. Uh, it had some popularity in the European community, but but it was stopped. And, and it wasn't really until all of these other regulators started appearing with with uh, turrets of their own, Apex uh, leading the leading the way. Um, that uh, Scoop Pro thought about uh, about reconsidering, and so when they designed one, they said, "All right, we're going to design something that looks like a Mark 25." Um, it's familiar to divers. We're not going to pick something, you know, that's that's uh, minimalist, like this Hollist. Um, this Hollist is has got almost no weight to it. The heaviest part in it is the yoke. The rest is all carved out. And it's forged to be strong enough, but it doesn't carry the extra weight that the uh, that the uh, Mark 19 has. Um, and we'll look we'll look at why and, and what that offers to the to the uh, scuba pro divers. The big bugaboo, though, is is flow. Um, if if there's one thing that people are going to keep coming back to and over hitting you over the head with, is that the diaphragm can't flow as well as a as a piston. And that's true, uh, but I'd suggest to you that it's true but irrelevant. Um, the uh, world record for uh, the number of divers uh, diving on a single first stage has just uh, been set again uh, by Scuba Pro. They did this one in Korea uh, just a few months back, put 135 divers on, on one first stage with this elaborate snake of, of hoses leading to their seconds and climbed down to the bottom of the pool. So... There wasn't much air density to worry about, and you can do the math if you want. Um, if your average, you know, SAC rate or RMV is say 0.7 cubic feet a minute, uh, let's let's bump it up because all the kids were excited. So we'll call it a liter a minute, or a liter and a half a minute. So a liter and a half a minute, I'm sorry, a cubic foot and a half a minute times 135 is a couple hundred cubic feet a minute, and uh, and that's that's pretty hefty. Um, but if you look uh, at the ratings for the Mark 25, you see they've got 
300 cubic feet a minute. They had they had 20% to spare. Uh, and if you look at the Mark 19, though, uh, surprisingly, the Mark 19 could have done almost as well. Certainly could have handled all 135 divers in, in the pool, uh, which is a long way of saying uh, flow, big deal. Um, we, we've got so much overcapacity in our regulator technology these days that um, arguing about 6,900 liters per minute versus 8,500 liters per minute uh, is a waste of time. Uh, and uh, one of the premier regulators in the world for tough conditions uh, would be the Poseidon Extreme. Uh, it's passed the NORSOC test, literally the, well, I don't know if it's the only one or one of two because the uh, Maris um, uh, Proton, uh, Maris Proton model also made it to 200 meters, although with not with quite the same flow capability, but they're, they're now certified and they advertise themselves as certified to uh, 600 feet. Uh, and they do it with a 4,000 liter per minute flow. Um, so let's let's just sort of drop flow as a as a bugaboo for for diaphragms. Uh, the next consideration, though, is 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 ice formation, uh, as it was for the Mark 25 when they go through iteration after iteration on their thermal insulation system, changing the holes, changing the the bumpers, changing the spring coatings. Uh, ice is a problem. And if you are old enough to have read DA Aquamaster's posts, uh, and you'll see uh, one that I sent out by, by chat, your chat has a link to a, a, a funny post from 2008 that, uh, that starts arguing about the original Mark 19. Uh, uh, DA Aquamaster, who, who is a scuba pro expert, uh, both from an engineering and experience side, has a lot to say about uh, the Mark 25 and ice diving. But the new Mark 25, uh, Mark 25 uh, Evo is certified not only to EN250, but to EN250A. And that's where you start seeing these regulators appear now with a greater than 10 degree centigrade marker stamped on the case. Uh, and ones without, the ones without are good down to four degrees centigrade or even um, below freezing, as you see in the case of the Poseidon X Extreme. Well, the Mark 19 Evo is, is also. Uh, EN 250A certified means it can go to 200 feet or 163 feet, uh, four degrees centigrade, and carry two divers at 62 liters per minute RMV. So we're, we're talking a, a lot of throughput, a big ice ball, and yet the uh, the reg keeps keeps functioning. So if it's not flow and it's not ice, um, what is it? Well, let's let's uh, look at the old versus the new Mark 19. Just in pictures, I don't have an original Mark 19 to to uh, to share with you. Um, they, it was only sold for two years, I think, in Europe, and uh, and I've, I've never seen one. But from the pictures, you can see what motivated Scuba Pro to uh, change things up with their new model if they're going to join the turret uh, craze. Uh, Mark 19 was not only fatter, it was longer. It was a big Mark 25. And it it, uh, it got its haters on, on size alone. Uh, certainly, trim is a little bit of an, of a, of an issue uh, for some of us that are, that are really fine-tuned. And you add an extra uh, 150 grams, um, you may or may not change things. Now, that's nothing for people who used to dive the old Mark 7 honker with three and a half pounds of brass, but uh, nonetheless, it, it's a minor consideration. They stepped back in time. They did something that hadn't been done in a couple of decades and went from one mainspring to uh, to two. It's my, uh, yeah, I think my cursor's visible on the screen. You can see a standard a single spring, single mainspring uh, here in the old Mark 19. What they did is they trimmed off uh, three eighths of an inch in length by doubling it up with two shorter uh, springs. And of course the advertising says it's safer because you've got two springs, that's a bunch of nonsense. But the point is they were able to trim length by, uh, by uh, making combined springs the way uh, Poseidon did uh, 40 years ago. The, uh,
body itself is a little bit thinner and uh, they've lightened uh, as i say 100 grams or 150 grams off of off of the total weight um, when we start marching through the reg then next uh, most obvious thing is the the uh, ice control and that's on the outside you can't really see it on this on this cross section but we'll see it when we when we look at the case um, instead of paying attention to the fins out here the fins out here aren't where the problem is I mean it's a nice place to put a fin because you've got you've got free space but it's not where you shed temperature you've got this big chunk of brass that becomes a heat sink once it gets cold enough uh, and in that sense uh, something like this little Hollis minimalist uh, has a little bit of an advantage because it has less mass to hold on to cold once the ice ball forms um, but this isn't where the temperature drop occurs the temperature drop occurs right here where the expansion is and so what they did instead is they made some carve outs in the case here and here uh, including even the, the little holes that we use to uh, unscrew the top. They put a whole series of detents in the top, not for style, not to have more places to put your hook spanner, but because those increase the surface area that uh, sees seawater just above freezing and helps reduce that heat sink uh, issue. Next factor that they changed um, was the outflow. You can see in the original Mark 19, this little plastic dome that uh, made sense. It kind of curved the flow towards the turret. Uh, but you can't argue about the narrowness of this gap. And instead, Scuba Pro opened this up considerably by fractionally shortening uh, some components. Uh, most importantly, the balance chamber. We'll talk about the balance chamber uh, here when we compare it with Mark 17. Here they have essentially an old Mark 17 balance chamber, and here they've gone to a design which is, frankly, much more like Deep Six uh, than uh, than anybody else, with a wide open back end. And we'll talk about what how that works. Finally, uh, the uh, flow path to get from the orifice around to the turret. Uh, has been redesigned, and we'll see that uh, more clearly when we when we take the top off the rig. But where did uh, where did we start? Uh, we started with um, let's get all these other guys out of the way. We started with the Mark 19 as a follow-on to the Mark 17. So here they both. Uh, oh, uh, let me give you a different view. Okay, so here's our Mark 17 on the right. This is not an Evo. I'm sorry, I don't I don't own any Evos. And the uh, Mark 19 Evo uh, on the left. Uh, you can see how they've uh, they've changed up their uh, their sizing. Uh, and people complain about how big the Mark 19 is. It, it's not that much more, but it is a heavy rig, no doubt about it. The uh, bigger differences, though, are inside. And when you look inside, uh, the outflow tract for the Mark 17 uh, was really constrained. And when you think about how a, a uh, a regulator uh, works. Uh, if we look at this uh, piston regulator, uh, and I will once again thank uh, Kuv, who very kindly loaned this uh, to me for this. Uh, where does the airflow escape on a uh, on a piston? Yeah, other it's that big wide open bore down the middle, where gas comes out and comes out to the turret. But the meat of the action is right here at the joint between the seat and the piston knife edge. When that piston is closed and the knife edge is buried in the seat, obviously there's no flow at all. But when you start to take a breath, you have about this much motion. You're talking about a millimeter of motion as you breathe. So you've got 3,000 PSI tank air coming down the pipe, making a right angle and hitting 
this uh, this seat. Now it's got to do 180 to go down the other end to the uh, to the turret. It's a fairly convoluted path. And one of the most interesting things that that I've learned, uh, courtesy of of Luis, who's also here on school board uh, with a lot of experience and engineering expertise in in gas flow, is that uh, the cave cone seat, the seat with this little divot in it, uh, was an improvement, not so much because it changed how you shifted from a knife edge to a rounded uh, piston that nestled into the into the cone of the seat, but because of the of the flow dynamics that changed when you had that V at the bottom and the swirl that you get when you go past the piston edge, make a U-turn and come back as opposed to making a sharp right angle uh, was part of why the Mark 10 acquired such a, a significant improvement in flow when they went from a, fa a flat seat uh, to one with a, with a cave cone. Well, the same sort of thing is true uh, in the Mark 17, when they transitioned to the Mark 17 Evo, uh, if you look up here, what they did in the Evo is they carved away a deeper channel, and uh, we'll see that uh, when we take the uh, take the top off. But I think I might have a picture here. Uh, additionally, in the Mark 17, your gas outflow to your second stage is is just it's just a right turn, and there you are. And this is part of what uh, makes the the flow uh, as good as it is, uh, despite that competition for space that happens at that small orifice with a pin in the middle of it obstructing half of your flow. You only have to make a right turn and bingo, you're on your way out to your second stage regulator. So Mark 19 had to make up for that by really creating some space in here, which is why this regulator remains as fat as it is. Because they need the passageway in fact, four of them in the Mark 19 Evo uh, to bring gas to the turret without uh, without compromising flow. Uh, we'll come back to this in a little bit. Let's uh, let's look at some other stuff here. Let's let's start taking these things apart. Here is a uh, here is a Mark 19, uh, not the Evo, and uh, just as a little uh, a little uh, trick for you to to notice. Here is a true Mark 19. If you look at the base plate on the bottom. And here is a three hundred dollar Mark nineteen that I or Mark seventeen uh, that I picked up for a hundred bucks because this is actually a sub gear SG fifty, and the only difference is a slight difference in the casting of the case, but everything else is identical. Uh, the top of the uh, of the Mark seventeen only has two flats. The uh, SG50 has six, like a like a hex nut, but otherwise it is identical to the Mark 9 or Mark 17, and was a good way uh, if you like the Mark 17 to uh, snag it at a at a real bargain. Uh, by the way, the Mark 17 is being discontinued. Uh, at least that's what Scuba Pro says. They have um, made a decision to uh, to concentrate their their diaphragm energies on the Mark 19 Evo. And the Mark 17 will come off the market. I don't know when. Uh, so snagging one used, snagging a Mark 17 Evo used, if you don't mind the hose routing or you prefer the hose routing, uh, would be a good move because the parts kits are the same. But let's take this, this guy apart and take a look inside. There's our environmental diaphragm. And we'll peel that off. and drop out the trans piston. Trans piston is a key structural component uh, that has its own set of engineering into it to determine whether or not a regulator will be, they use the term overbalanced, and that's, the, that's just the wrong word, but that's the one that, that uh, Aqualung has chosen to use. When your 
regulator senses ambient pressure as you descend. That ambient pressure adds to the force on the diaphragm so that the relative intermediate pressure stays that same 135 all the way from here down to 200 feet. Even if you add 15, 30, 45, 60, 75 PSIs of, of extra pressure, and your true intermediate pressure actually goes up from 135 to, to 300, the relative IP, because of the pressure on your body from the, from the seawater, uh, remains the same, even if your, your hoses get really stiff. Well, this trans piston has to be very carefully um, engineered to provide the same amount of pressure from ambient uh, seawater, which is now not seeing the inside of this regulator because of the diaphragm. That's got to provide exactly the same amount of pressure on the diaphragm as the seawater would have. And Aqualung has a, has a feature that they call overbalancing, which they call an advantage. And all rebreather divers say is a disadvantage because as you descend with a sealed aqualung, what happens is that that diaphragm is a little bit larger in area. It puts more force on the diaphragm as you descend so that your relative IP begins to rise just a little bit. And they say that's an advantage because with thicker air at five or six atmospheres, having a higher relative IP makes it easier to breathe. Well, what it also means is that if you're flying a downstream regulator like a C350 or or any of a number of, uh, of aqualung downstream rigs, at some point your rig might start to free flow if you've tuned it too, too hot. If you're a rebreather diver, that higher relative IP makes your solenoid work harder to click open the valve to add oxygen to your system if you have an electronic uh, CCR and uh, aqualung isn't too happy or isn't too popular in that, in that regard. Uh, the Mark 17, on the other hand, is, is very widely used in technical circles simply because of the superb match between absolute increases in ambient pressure and what's transmitted to the diaphragm. Well, if we unscrew the diaphragm clamp, and I'm not just strong, it's loose, that's, that's uh, 250 to 300 uh, inch pounds of torque to fasten this down. You've got your transmitter, which carries the force from the mainspring or from that transmission onto the diaphragm your mainspring, and uh, maybe an anti-friction washer to keep tuning smooth. Let's go ahead and pull off these thrust washers. And, and there's a whole interesting debate about why Scuba Pro has two thrust washers for some models and only one for others. And it has to do with what the CE approval was at the time and what they'd have to pay to, to re-engineer it. Um, but let's look inside. Easiest way to remove a diaphragm is to uh, just use a little air pressure. So I'll just pop that off and then I can pull the diaphragm out of the way, drop the hat, the valve lifter and the pin out. Actually, let's put the pin back in because now we can get a feel for exactly how much impediment to flow there is when you, uh, when you compare it with a piston. The bore of a piston is obviously much bigger than this, um, but uh, the, uh, the diaphragms hold their own at 6,500 to 6,900 liters per minute. But you can see what they've done here to facilitate flow right out to the, uh, to the um, intermediate pressure size off to your second stages. What they've done is they've dug a little groove in the, uh, in the case that leads directly to, to what they are very prone to call high flow ports. And these high flow ports have a uh, direct shot from the lid that is created by this valve lifter. And so that just squirts right out to the side. The other two ports are below it, and there is a bore down the middle that leads to those, but the extra convolution supposedly makes them less high flow. Uh, the difference is irrelevant for, for uh, any reasonable dive, including technical dives, and there's no reason not to use both of them on, on, on one side. Now, if you compare the Mark 17 Evo with the Mark 17, let's see if I have a, I do have a picture somewhere. We'll come back to it in a minute. What they did for the Evo was they dug a little deeper groove. They made this a little bit wider. They 
spread it out onto where these threads are for the low pressure port and created a little bit better flow pattern, which was enough to add uh, another 400 liters per minute. If we look at the high pressure compartment for this regulator, We see a makeup which is true for virtually, well, no, I won't say every, but the vast majority of diaphragm rigs out on the market today. So inside, we have our little volcano. You can just see its, its uh, edges there. And you see that cup, that little cup in there around the edge of the volcano is analogous to the cave cone seat. By creating a swirling action for gas flow as opposed to a right angle, you improve airflow. And then you can see the, uh, the poppet here, and we'll put this under the microscope where you, where you can see the uh, little circle that is, uh, that is created by the, uh, by the volcano. So let's compare that with the Mark 19 Evo. Same, uh, same deal on the top. It's got the same uh, environmental seal as the Mark 17. We'll just peel that off and set that aside. It has a metal disc for a trans piston and a, a little uh, click on pusher. And the advantage that it, this has is it's uh, slightly um, stronger plastic uh, than it was before, uh, but these are otherwise um, uh, ready-made components from other parts of the Scuba Pro in inventory. The advantage that this has, I think, over its predecessors, that it is not as prone to deformation. The apex regulators, there's a thread on Scuba Board uh, about this subject, uh, the uh, apex regulators will crush the end of this trans piston at around 10 to 15 atmospheres, which means if you had uh, below 300 feet uh, with uh, certain apex regs, uh, your reg will no longer continue responding uh, with an increased relative uh, or a, an increased absolute intermediate pressure and the relative IP will begin to drop. And as that, uh, as that occurs, your uh, your reg will get uh, get harder to breathe. Scoopro has done a, an annoying thing. They've they've switched from the near universal uh, six millimeter adjuster to seven. Um, but uh, and and when you buy a set of uh, hex keys at the uh, at the store, you'll notice that they come uh, six, eight, ten, but they uh, they don't have a seven unless you unless you order it. Uh, I may not have pre loosened this one, so let's uh, let's throw this in the vise and uh, and open this up for real. Thirty-four millimeter, or thirty-two millimeter, rather, um, wrench, and it can't be too too thick. I've taken the one from Scuba Tools, and I actually had to grind a couple of millimeters off it to uh, work with the Mark Seventeen because the Mark Seventeen has this little disc that takes up two millimeters, a little trim ring, and you can't get this on uh, unless you grind down the wrench. But uh, small point. So as we look at uh, the top end of this, it's very much like the Mark 17 and anti-thrust washer in the adjustment uh, cap. These combined springs, two springs that are short to uh, provide your, your uh, intermediate pressure adjustment, a nice wide uh, pressure disc on the, uh, on the bottom, but then the same arrangement with regard to the diaphragm 
as we had with the Mark 17. Two thrust washers. And uh, now let's see what it's like in the same diaphragm, same uh, valve lifter. Slight, uh, no, I guess it looks like the same design on the uh, on the hat as well. But now we can see the way they've arranged the uh, gas flow. The uh, center hole is about the same uh, diameter. Uh, and we'll look at some measurements in a moment. But what they've done instead is they've created four gas flow pathways so that there isn't a preferential um, high flow port, low flow port. Two of them are larger than the other two. And that's because of these ice fins, these anti-icing fins that have taken uh, some of the diameter away on the, on the trip up. And we'll look at that in just a moment. Pin is uh, a different spec, a different length, but, uh, but otherwise uh, very close. And, uh, and it looks very similar to Mark 17, but the gas flow between the 17 plane versus the 19 Evo is about 400 liters per minute difference. The uh, diaphragm clamping for this regulator is amongst the highest in the, uh, in the industry. They use 310 inch pounds uh, to put this clamp on and it's lubricated and for those of you who've uh, taken our little regulator seminar, uh, we'll, uh, we'll note adding lube to this uh, significantly increases the axial loads on the threads. So this is an engineering feat with regard to uh, metallurgy and, uh, and thread pitch that uh, really kind of sets Scuba Pro uh, apart uh, that they can specify 310 inch pounds of torque with a lubricated thread and it doesn't deform or strip the reg uh, itself. Um, that, that may or may not be really true and whether or not this thin diaphragm needs that much uh, torque to, to grab it with that little thin uh, grabbing edge uh, is, uh, is open to some question. And the reason I say that, because when you look at, and you can't see it any, anymore because I cleaned it up for the, for the uh, the show here, but when I took this apart today on this Mark uh, 17, there was a little fine sprinkling of, of brass sprinkles in here where I think the, uh, the uh, diaphragm clamp, uh, not of this regulator, but of the, uh, the other one that, I, that I've tuned uh, for our demo, uh, had started to see some, some, some thread wear. So it's a lot of torque. And most other manufacturers don't exceed about 250 inch pounds. Uh, and then we'll talk about Apex's approach to this uh, uh, to follow. Last part we'll take apart is the uh, is the top cap, and you'll see how they handle the uh, the uh, flow arrangements for it. I won't take the I won't take the uh, you know, I'm gonna have to do this properly too. I won't swing the other camera around just yet, not for this. So when we take the top off of this, you see why they get away with having the uh, ports at the whole other end. This is a huge outflow track. They've got a very large hex brooch here to disassemble the turret, very nice sloping uh, flow direction, and uh, you can see the four holes where it uh, comes out of the uh, the diaphragm side uh, right here. Now, because it's got a turret, the high pressure compartment is hidden uh, inside, and this is just the same way that the Deep Six and the Apex uh, F 
FTR, I uh, can't remember my model name, uh, hide this underneath the turret because it's, it's the only place that it can be design-wise. So you have to take your turret off to get access to the high-pressure compartment. Um, to uh, open this up, you you need to, to uh, buy one of the uh, Scuba Pro quick disconnect uh, toys uh, for servicing their, their, uh, their computers uh, because that's got the pin space that you need to open this up. You can certainly remove it with a standard uh, pin spanner. That's no big deal. It's nice because you can control it by keeping pressure on it this way, and loosen it up. But when it comes to do the opposite action and uh, and uh, torque it back in when you're done, uh, that pin spanner won't help you there. So we'll take this apart. Remember, it's got a little spring loading to it. But once you take it apart, you'll see it is just like the Mark 17. Drop that out, and it looks very familiar. There's interesting difference, though, between the two of them with regard to how they do their balancing. The uh, Mark 17 has the standard pop it with a hole down the middle. But if you look at a deep six, it's got a solid, it's got a solid shaft to the to the high pressure seat. It's like, wait a second, that's that's what the 300 Poseidon has. That's an unbalanced regulator because there's no way for air to get down the center of the poppet to get into the chainer and and balance the back end. Well, in fact, Scuba Pro doesn't need a hole down the middle of that uh, of that poppet, and you could fill it up with grease, being overly uh, generous with your lube and not affect the balancing at all. Because if you look at this balance chamber and turn it around right there, you'll see a little tiny hole. And that uh, is actually where the majority of the balancing occurs. And it's also why there's a second O-ring here to seal this compartment off so that as air comes in from the intermediate pressure side, it fills the back end and provides the counterforce to the poppet. The Mark 19 makes it a little bit more obvious. They just have a big ass hole in the back end. There's, it's wide open and you can see the poppet right in there. And that's the same uh, design that, uh, that uh, Deep Six uses uh, in, in uh, their, in their uh, balanced diaphragm. And because there's a hole in the back end, there's no need for that second O-ring to seal there. Uh, and these are both torqued to around uh, 80, 80 inch pounds. So it's fairly, fairly light torque. Well, this introduction to balancing uh, raises uh, the next question about, about diaphragm regulators. You know, when we all started with with actually, let me uh, let me just avoid since these are working regs. Let me just avoid making a mess here and uh, put the parts away just temporarily. Um, when we when we started our uh, scuba 101 and talked about theory, uh, they talk about diaphragm regulators changing their IP in an opposite fashion to uh, to uh, pistons. And as you all know, a diaphragm is supposed to go up as the tank falls in pressure, or as a piston goes down. And we'll uh, we'll take a look and see if that's in fact the case. But the history all started with the unbalanced regs, and when you have an unbalanced first stage and an unbalanced second, you have a prescription for really scary breathing effort when uh, when your tank gets empty. Now, of course, that was touted as a, I'm sorry, uh, on the piston side, because your your uh, IP is dropping and your effort of breathing is is going up. On the diaphragm side, that was advertised as a as a deliberate benefit, when in fact it was nothing deliberate about it. It was just the the physics of it all. Um, but let's look at that in a uh, in a slide and just go through a, a little bit without doing any nonsense numbers we'll just look at the concept of balancing and then and then see what that looks like on the on the gas bench so 
So here we have a diagram, diagrammatic uh, representation of, a, uh, of an unbalanced uh, diaphragm. Um, why is it unbalanced? Because there's no hole down the middle of the poppet. There is no path for intermediate pressure air to sneak around to the back end and help push the poppet closed as, as tank pressure drops. So when we look at the numbers, we're not really going to look at the numbers, but when we uh, look at this, uh, we see that our mainspring is very close to our IP. When you uh, dial this in, uh, the reason it's got 150 pounds on it is because you want no net force on that diaphragm there when you got 135 pounds per square inch of intermediate pressure pushing out on the diaphragm. You need a spring pressure that's almost the same uh, to, uh, to counteract that. Uh, there's a little bit more that's helping the main spring, and that's, in fact, the little tiny spring that's behind the, the poppet, the five pounds that it uh, provides more or less, helps shut this poppet off earlier in the pressurization cycle when the air is rushing in from the tank and into the intermediate pressure chamber. This little five pounds extra pressure slams that close just a fraction earlier than it would without it. So 150 minus five is 145. Uh, and we've got uh, one more factor uh, going on, however, and that's the area of this um, orifice. If you think about spitting watermelon seed out of your mouth, uh, the force that that comes out with is a function of the pressure in your, in your mouth and how tightly you purse your lips. And so if we have a 3000 PSI tank and we have this little hole in there, that's about a hundredth, 150th of a square inch, 3000 times 150th is 20 pounds of extra pressure. So now we've got five pounds from the spring, 20 pounds from the blast of air coming uh, down the pipe. And whatever IP is created to counterbalance this, this spring. And when you do the math, 150 minus five minus 20 is 125 PSI. So that's what you see with a full tank. As that tank pressure disappears, you have less assist on that poppet closure than you had before. And in an empty tank, pushing against that one 150th of a square inch, instead of 30, uh, 20 pounds of, of slam, you've only got two. So with only two pounds of pressure helping to close that poppet, it leaves more time for the IP to collect, and the IP goes up with a falling tank. So there's the, there's the numbers. Let's, uh, let's look at this in, uh, in the real world. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do, actually, what I'll do is I'm going to pull the gallery and I'm going to pin, I'm going to pin my my uh, pin to the second screen. Let's see if that works. What did you see? Uh, let me try it. Try again. Pin to the first screen. There we go. That's what I want. Okay, I'm going to put the. Uh, be in the gallery up. Where is that? Okay. And I'm going to go over to the uh, to the gas bench and uh, and take this uh, take this Poseidon 300 uh, with me. So right now, as you can see, I've got the. Uh, Gas supply set at about 350 psi uh, pressure. Maybe it's just a little high there. I've only got 1600 left in the tank, so I've got some full tanks over on the other side. We'll use for the other demos, and we'll put this uh, we'll put this regulator on the on the gas bench. I've got a second stage is my emergency purge. I've got a another IP gauge here we'll use over on the on the table, but the one you want to watch is over here. And essentially, at 300 psi, what's our intermediate pressure going to be when I uh, when I crank this open? I guess what I have to do is I've got to put a uh, intermediate pressure hose on. I forgot to hook that up from the regulator to the uh, <laughs> regulator to the 
to the gauge. We've got 160 psi of pressure. Let's go ahead and look at that when we when we do this the right way. And I'll throw a, a proper uh, hose on here. All right, let's try this again. We'll hook up the gauge to the to the regulator properly, and let's see what we get. When we crank it open, I see 156 psi of pressure. 154. There's a little bit of drift in this old reg. It's 40 years old. I haven't serviced this in a while, but you can see this is just nice, nice lockup. So let's start adding pressure and uh, see what happens to our IP. We got 154 now. When I get it up to a little over 1,000, it's already dropped 10 PSI down to 142. When I get up to the max in this tank, it's already down to 138. And when I put this, uh, this regulator on a 3,000 PSI tank, uh, you'll see it's down around 130. So this, this has a 30 PSI IP creep or IP uh, shift. Uh, from full to empty tank, and that's that's the uh, actual demonstration of what we just looked at in the slide in terms of the loss of assist in poppet closure from falling tank pressure. So everybody talks about how uh, how balanced their regulators are, and people complain about regs that uh, that don't uh, that don't do as well. Uh, let's look at a pile and uh, and see uh, and see what we get. Okay, so here I've got a 3,000 psi tank. Let's do our final check on that uh, on that uh, old 300. So we had 160 psi at uh, at 300 tank. Now with 3,000 tank, let's let's see what happens here. Hundred and twenty seven. Hundred and twenty seven to hundred and sixty shift. That's uh that's scary. I don't know of a second stage that could tolerate that much of a drop. Well actually I do. A D four hundred wouldn't mind a drop from a hundred and thirty five down to hundred and twenty, but uh otherwise not not many. Let's look at uh let's look at our uh mark nineteen since that's what we're here for. Okay, 3,000 PSI, and the intermediate pressure is 134, 135. I just happen to have a tank with 300 here too. So let's throw it on a 300 tank. We had 134. Uh, with the full tank, let's see what we get with an empty tank. So here's our handy dandy empty tank. And oh, something's leaking. There you go. And the IP is 142. So 135 to 142, that's a seven PSI shift from full to empty tank. That's average. Average um, balancing for a uh, for a second stage. Uh, can you do better? Well, uh, it's a funny thing. When I first tested this while I was setting up for the for the little show, uh, there was ten psi drift, or I'm sorry, ten psi shift between full and empty tank, and that's not what I remembered out of this out of this regulator. And I thought, man, that's crazy. So I just popped the uh, the uh, high pressure chamber out of the back, lubricated the shaft of the poppet, put it back in, and boom, the 10 psi change from full to empty dropped down to seven. So I improved it by by you know 30, 40 percent just by throwing a little lube on there, and that's something that you will see a lot of. For example, the best regulator I've ever seen in this regard was this old Mars MR22. Big heavy piece of thing, and I used to tell people that uh, that regulator had zero um, uh, shift between full and empty tank. I haven't 
looked at the thing in, until tonight in the, in the last several months, but when we do the same thing with the regulator that I thought that was the best in the whole damn world, despite its age, um, it didn't last. Um, so let's compare what used to be my best regulator in that regard with the Mark 19. We're not going to go through all of these. I just happen to have made a little chart for us in the next slide. So it's just fun to, to demo it one time at least. So full tank, 3,000 PSI. Uh, is this visible? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, I see 140 PSI with a full tank. Yeah, make it 137 with a full tank. One of the things that is worth looking at, though, is the superb performance of this regulator um, under full purge. I don't know what this. I may I may turn off my microphone just so the Vox doesn't kill things. Although you couldn't hear the hiss when I did that, this rig had less than 15 psi of drop on full wide open purge out of a C350, which is one of the highest delivering uh, downstream regulators uh, around. And, and that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, let's put this same regulator on a empty tank for the same demo. And we'll look at both items again. So here's our here's our IP gauge, 300 psi tank, and we had a what did we have? 137 before, and now it's 139. Two psi drift or two psi shift between full tank and empty tank here. But there is something that you should look at from a safety standpoint that's worth uh, uh, keeping in mind because it applies to all of these regulators. We saw that little tiny flicker. This reg kept up, or the Mark 19, and this one uh, kept up with, with um, air delivery with a wide open second stage. Well, when your tank's starting to get empty, let's watch that same fluctuation in the uh, in the uh, Needle on full purge now. You can see it's dropping 50, 60 PSI. So if you're working at depth with a regulator on a on a near empty tank, not only are going you're going to be depleting your air supply fairly quickly, uh, you're going to really notice under exertion that uh, that. The regulator can't keep up. Uh, I don't think it's much better with the piston. Both are subject to much greater dynamic flow drops um, when you don't have much driving pressure uh, pounding through that tank orifice. But let's look at the uh, at the summary that I that I put together and uh, see uh, where they uh, where they come out. Poseidon 300 had a 30 PSI change from full to empty tank. And at the other end of the spectrum, by the way, the Mark 25 shows a full 9 PSI in the other direction. It may be the highest flow regulator in the world, but its balancing is meh. Uh, the bottom line is it, it really doesn't matter. For most balanced second stages, they can tolerate 15 PSI of uh, intermediate pressure change with uh, essentially no uh, no change in in perceived air delivery. Uh, it just uh, it just isn't uh, that significant. At low pressures, however, uh, the drop in in IP in dynamic IP will produce a a, a palpable a suck that you have to exert to to keep up, and you may not have enough air delivery at depth with a high workload. Uh, as we walk down the down the line up there, the old Mark 17 uh, was pretty poor. 
and it was one of the reasons why I stayed away from diaphragm regulators for a long time until I until I uh, uh, started servicing Poseidons. Um, deep six is is average in that regard, but I've seen I've seen much better in the uh, in in various manu uh, manufacturing runs of of deep six in terms of of balancing, and it has to do um, with the incredibly fine. Um, differences that we're going to look at in, in the next slide uh, in dimensions that, that affect this, this balancing effort. Uh, as you see uh, today, the, the MARS, which in my last test was five PSI difference, is down to, down to two uh, now. Uh, the Hollis, that little minim minimalist uh, reg, was at five. The Aqualung is known for their stability, uh, as is MARS. Uh, both of them are known for their IP stability. And the reason is, for Mara is at least because Mara uses downstream second stages. Uh, their premier second stage, their abyss second stages with that little um, uh, Venturi tube on the side uh, are all downstream regs. So they're critically dependent on, on IP to open the valve. And that's why they actually also prescribe a slightly higher IP than most other brands. Uh, Mars is around 140, 142, whereas everybody else is in the 130, 135 range. Uh, the Evo for us uh, that we saw just now was about seven. Um, when it was uh, on a previous test, it was down as low as four. And the old reliable Conshelf uh, also does very, very respectably uh, at four. The uh, the Hog, the Hog regulator is, is designed by the same guy that designed the Deep Six. They have a very similar a balance chamber, a wide open back end to the balance chamber. This particular one uh, came out at two. Uh, I don't remember it being that good, but you can't argue with what the measurements say. Uh, but remember the key um, in, uh, component that, uh, that lubrication takes because uh, friction or the wrong choice of O-ring, if, uh, if you have an O-ring that, uh, that is say a Duro 70 instead of a Duro 90, it's very good at sealing because it's soft and sticky, but it impedes poppet motion back and forth more than a harder O-ring will. A uh, harder O-ring is tougher to get a seal and you have to have a nice, perfectly shiny um, poppet shaft to seal against that tiny 006 uh, because that's one source of, of IP creep. The other source of IP creep is the seal between the volcano and the, and the seat itself, but don't forget the balance chamber O-ring. And if you use a soft one to get a better seal, you probably also see a bigger spread in intermediate pressure because the poppet motion is a little sluggish. So how do we get this, this balancing to come out so uh, well or not well, depending upon your opinions of a seven PSI drift or seven, I don't know what to call that shift in, in IP. That seven PSI change from full to empty tank is a function of thousands no ten thousandths of an inch if you do the math uh i put this uh, this poppet we had right here under the under the microscope and and you put a micrometer on that and you see that it turns out to be 0. 0.121 inches in diameter so you can use the old geometry formula from uh, from school to compute the area and if you read Regulator Savvy by uh, Pete Wolfinger, he'll, he'll tell you how to convert that to pounds. I mean, it's basically pounds per square inch. So you've got 3,000 pounds of tank applied against X square inches, and you have a certain amount of force, just like we looked at in that slide, looking about the counterbalancing force in a balanced or unbalanced regulator. So when we do the math here, we see that the orifice area comes out to X some value here. But oops, don't forget, we got to subtract out the pin because the pin is taking up part of the of the hole here if this is our big hole where air is flowing well the middle of it's taken up by a, a pin that's 58 thousandths of an inch in diameter and when you or i'm sorry 100 and 116 thousandths of an inch in diameter and when you do pi r squared which is half of that width uh, you end up with that number well you subtract that from the number we got up here for the for the hole and we came up with so many square inches okay big deal what is what does that mean well, the interesting thing is when you look at that number and then you measure the poppet shaft and do the pi r squared deal, you see that you have two areas that are within four hundred thousandths, ten thousandths of an inch in area. Um, that's how well engineered Scuba Pro uh, does this. That's how they all have to do it. 
to make the numbers come out right. Um, so that as tank pressure drops, the relative assist on the poppet closure uh, doesn't change because of the loss of the tank uh, impetus. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. I think that's all the, the slides we have, thank God. Uh, yep, no more, no more slides. Um, what do we want to talk about, anything? Free for all. Quick question, please. Yeah, go jump on in. A any plans, and this is kind of maybe off, uh, you know, Scuba Pro Insider information, but any plans for Scuba Pro to ever make their kits available to the public, perhaps? No. That would be the short answer. Um, it's interesting looking at Scuba Pro's marketing, trying to get a feel. I'm not an insider by any, any means. Um, Rene Dupre and I go back, you know, 15 years and we've been talking a long time and, and I've sent him some, some comments that I, I think might've even been taken into account with regard to things like the new D420 and how it's tuned properly. Uh, but getting a feel for what goes on out of Italy is, is, is hard to know. Uh, they, they are pretty good at making the wrong decision from time to time. Um, but the, the bottom line is they are committed to the dealer model. Um, it, they, they may be 20 years behind the times and not recognizing what's happening with regard to internet sales and do it yourself and the right to repair act that the deer tractor owners are, are forcing on, um, their equivalent manufacturers that don't want to give them access to the, to their black boxes. Um, but no, Scuba Pro isn't interested in, in doing that because they realize if they do that, they'll, they'll be yanking the rug out from underneath, uh, the dealers and until dealers, latch on to this and realize that uh, that they have to do business a different way, um, they're going to continue to decline. I don't know why it's that way, frankly, because if you look at service in a shop, it's not a moneymaker. Um, and I've got to say, it, it just, it irritates the piss out of me when I see somebody complaining about a $200 service bill, because when you look at what goes into that if it's done properly and a lot of it isn't I'll, i will grant you that but that's partly self-inflicted because they can't afford to pay the techs enough to learn their job to do it right every time and it's very unforgiving of mistakes kind of like aviation it, it, you have to do it completely right every time and these kids just don't learn the theory they just change the parts but uh, 30 dollars for a regulator if a regulator is cleaned and you get rid of all the verdigris and you take a toothbrush to the threads and you leave it in phosphoric acid and you run it through the ultrasonic and you dry the parts and you inspect it. And then you compare the service bulletins for maybe six brands that you're servicing. And you got to be up on 15 service bulletins for each one because they're changing little nicks and necks. Uh, it's a lot of, it's a full-time job for a tech who's making um, double minimum wage. And then when the shop charges you $30 for that, uh, minus expendables and rent and, and gas, um, they don't make much money. They, they do make it on the kits. The, the kits are, 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 I don't know, I, they're probably about 100% markup. Um, and, and so that's why the do-it-yourselfers do well with McMaster car O-rings and wherever they can get a high-pressure poppet. Um, but no, they, they haven't realized that if they gave service away completely, they wouldn't lose that much. Um, guys like us would still be coming to the shop for kits and they could still get their 100% markup for the kits. And then we'd, we'd take on the labor. They just haven't tweaked to the fact that, that giving up that, um, that service portion um, won't cost them any money. And I think the reason for that is that um, part of the service visit, uh, worth it or not for the money, is the visit. And while you're there, well, you'll you'll buy a, a this or a that or a new reg or a wetsuit, and and uh, getting people into the shop for any reason whatsoever is is critical to the survival of that business model, which is why so many shops have you know party nights and 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 free educational seminars. They just want to get you into the shop to buy something which is sold at a huge markup, like the parts are. No, they won't let you service their regs. Uh, they'll take away the privileges of the um, 
shop that that sells you stuff under the table if they find out about it and and uh believe me that the shops that i happen to work with under the table are are just like they have shaken their finger at me so many times don't you ever say that you ever bought a, a kit from us and and um, i don't know where i got my kits but anyway that's the same thing faces all of you guys um it's not a good situation and it's why people are going to deep six who who looks at you and says we're going to we're going to have a reg manufactured with the same CNC computer controlled machinery um, that that Scuba Pro uses, albeit in Taiwan instead of Italy. But we're going to hold them to the same um, uh, spec adherence. So this is not mainland China. This is in in Taiwan. So equivalent to equivalent to manufacturing capabilities to to Europe. And not only that, we're going to sell you the parts and we're going to teach you how to do it. Um, it's, a, I think it's the beginning of a tidal wave. Hog does it. Deep Six does it. Now Poseidon does it. You can go to a Poseidon seminar, learn how to uh, service their regs. Um, they still won't sell you the parts, but I think um, dealers are are being encouraged to go ahead and sell you parts at their markup um, so that you can service your own Poseidon gear. Um, but there aren't too many more like that. I mean, even the mass market regs like Dive Right. You just you can't get the manuals. You can't you can't get access to the pieces. So it's it's still restricted in that way. And and I disagree with it, but it's one reason why Deep Six is doing well. But the problem with a you know a, a relatively undercapitalized business like that compared with a behemoth like like Scuba Pro or Hewish, which owns you know four brands now, uh, is that they have a lot of money behind engineering upgrades. Whereas whereas Chris Richardson has to do it based on his own experience and his you know, hard-earned uh, experience with with Hog Edge, Hog Edge. before he formed uh, Deep Six. Tough, so tough Rob, Rob, just to uh, just to clarify, uh, Poseidon only allows that in the U.S. Oh, is that right? Okay, yeah. well, nowhere else, and and also some European countries like Germany, I believe, uh, you can buy service parts for anything because of their laws. Yes. Yes, that is true. A lot of people buy Apex stuff. I bought Apex stuff from Scuba Gaskets. It's about the only thing I do buy from Scuba Gaskets. Like, that guy drives me nuts, but I can get Apex seats from them, and and that's good. Because if you have a seat and you can spec out the O-rings, uh, you can you can uh, you can do all the rest yourself. Uh, well, diaphragms too. This diaphragm engineering is is pretty good uh, with these thin thin diaphragms. Uh, Although nothing holds a candle to that uh, Poseidon Kevlar impregnated rolling diaphragm in the extreme, but that's a whole different technology. Um, but all these are the same. I mean, they're they're all very close to the same, and it's amazing when you look at the math how tightly things have to be machined uh, to hold even a semblance of balance from full to empty tank. But uh, with this capability, and I think we can thank China for that, um, just sort of forcing that that commonality of engineering. You know, how do you how do you make an improvement that that attracts business? Uh, well, Scoop Pros are doing it based on their reputation and joining the turret craze, and I think they've done well with Mark 19. Is the IP spread as as good as 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 Hog or as as Mars? Uh, maybe not, but we all know that that doesn't matter with a balanced second. It just doesn't matter. So you can whip them for it, um, but that's not where the where the money is. The money is in ice resistance. Which this excels at, and uh, and flow. I mean, 6,900 liters a minute out of a diaphragm is is pretty damn impressive. Uh, last two questions. Sorry, uh, the fine machining tolerances you talked about there. What's the risk when you go to service these? If you nick anything, is it is it is a bunch of parts shot? Can you sand it yourself, like with a Mark 25, or is it you drop it once and it's done, kind of thing, or? Um, that that's a subject for a two day course. <laughs> the uh, the answer is yes. If if you scratch it, oh, where's that reg? If you scratch it, your your reg is a doorstop. Here is a here is a Mark twenty five. I don't think I can get the uh, I don't think I can get the the light in it now. But uh, this was sent to me uh, by the shop that I work with, uh, and they they send me stuff because they know I'll take the time. With a with a with a uh, a 
a rig that's problematic that they just don't want to have their their text do it because I just do it for the for the love of it. Anyway, they sent me this Mark Twenty Five that just leaked and leaked, and they uh, they couldn't they they couldn't uh, figure out why. I mean, not that it was that hard, but it, it it took more time investment than they wanted to spend, and so they sent it to me. And when I held this up to the light and ran a a magnifying glass down inside, you could see. Oh, I'm doing the wrong camera. Uh, you could see. Well, we got a light on it there. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it without a microscope because I can't get the little glisten. Anyway, there is a little line in there from the bottom to the top, a little groove that was cut in this because uh, a, a tech decided to extract this o-ring down at the bottom of that of that bore with a pick and it wasn't a brass pick it must have been a steel pick and he just and now the o-ring is hanging on the edge of the pick so i've got to get that out so he dragged that tool all the way out of the regulator oh got the o-ring but there now was an air pathway at 300 psi uh, that made this rig a doorstop uh, it's my scavenger rig now because I got a yoke out of it and a knob out of it. And it's a demo for other things. Um, but the body itself uh, earned the, the customer a new regulator because of a technician's error. And and my, my mantra for this is it's not rocket science, but it's incredibly precise. If you don't have a nerd's attention to detail, following steps precisely, um, you will screw it up. You'll forget it, something. I mean, I've had rigs come in and they're missing a key O-ring. And it's like, how did this guy survive his last dive? Um, and, uh, it's, it's just not meant for people with a high school education and minimal attention to detail. It's not hard stuff. I mean, this is pretty simple mechanism, but hundreds of a thousandth of an inch. Yeah, it, it counts. I mean, how else do you, do you leverage when you, when you suck in a breath that's, and we have a cracking effort of one inch, uh, or 1.2 inches on a standard regulator. How many PSI is that? That's four hundredths of one pound per square inch. When you that's one inch of water column. Four hundredths of one PSI, and you're starting from three thousand PSI. So three thousand divided by 0 0.04 is a ratio of tens and tens of thousands. And so you've got a mechanical valve that enables you to breathe effortlessly under the water that is controlling a ratio of tens of thousands by mechanics, not servo electronics, but mechanicals. And it has to be done in two stages. Well, it doesn't have to be, but it, it's the most safe and reliable way to do it. But even in two stages, it's amazing what we do with 3,000 pounds of bomb on our back uh, to be able to breathe effortlessly. Yeah, it's, it's very fine tolerances. All right, guys. Well, that's all I got to offer. Um, uh, you know where to find me on, on school board and happy to, happy to chat with you. Uh, you're welcome to, to, uh, come do a, a repair seminar with me sometime. If you want to do that, I'm going to take a break after this January one for a few months and then we'll pick it up again in the summer, but, uh, it's been good having you along. And, uh, I, I hope you agree like I did that, uh, the, the Mark 19, I think, really kind of is the cat's meow. Oh, actually, this is it. Since I've got you all here and I don't see people disappearing off of the roster, then I'll, I'll, I'll claim a soapbox. Why do I hate the Mark 25? Um, I hate the Mark 25 because of water. Um, water and sand. And so, you know, here in, in, in Northern California, the sand is real floaty. It's not coral sand. I don't know quite why. Um, but it's, it's, it's floaty sand. And when you get sand and salt crystals, because it's hard to rinse this rig completely. So you leave a little salt water in there and then it dries out because you're not going diving for three months before your next trip. And now you have a little line of salt crystals around the O-ring because that's right where the water collected and where it was moist the longest. So when that finally evaporates, you have a little light, tiny rim of salt crystals. And the next time you turn the rig on, it goes, and it just keeps scraping away at the inside uh, until it, until it dissolves again. 
Well, after 20 years of that, your chrome is gone. You've got a nice first set of vertical grooves in there and, and a reg that should have lasted 40 years um, doesn't because of, of lack of maintenance or lack of attention to detail and who, who wants to rinse this regulator so thoroughly every time. Well, that's what you have to do if you own a Mark 25. If you owned a Mark 10 or a Mark 5, School Pro had this right. I mean, it's why the guys left Scuba Pro, the engineers, Toth and who else, Christopher, I can't remember their names, but two of the premier engineers from Scuba Pro left it to form Atomic Aquatics. They formed Atomic Aquatics because Scuba Pro stopped making the spec boot. The spec boot was a little container that held that thick old silicone grease, kept the water out, but the silicone responded to ambient pressure underneath this little roof this is a homemade one out of a piece of of uh, inner tube from a bicycle but but they used to have a, a proper one that flexed with with seawater pressure and the inside of this regulator never saw seawater and i have not tuned this regulator in um seven years and the only thing i've done to it is remove the uh, the yoke bolt because seawater does get along those threads until it meets the first o-ring so this gets removed and replaced, but otherwise I haven't retuned this. And this PS, its uh, IP has been stable for that period of time. I can't tell you how many Mark 25s I've serviced where I, I've got to polish by hand, or or the shop will charge you for a new a new uh, uh, piston land, replace the cap because the the chrome is gone and the scratches are there. There's just no need for that. The only rigs I like are sealed regulators. I like atomic pistons. Uh, I like a, a, a regulator from days gone by with a spec boot that's homemade, um, but I won't dive a Mark 25 except for demonstration purposes, flow or not, um, because I, I, I like things to work as engineered for a, a long period of time. I mean, does it really matter when you can buy a Deep Six for $250 and throw this out and get a new one every five years? Probably not, but uh, it's just kind of the principle of the thing for me. and. That's why this design irritates me, flow or not. Uh, it's seawater doesn't belong inside metal equipment, and that's the nice thing about diaphragms. Seawater doesn't go in there, except maybe for the for the cap, you know, where the spring is, and you just flush that out with a hose as hard as you want, and boom, that that gets clean again. Otherwise, this stays pristine inside, and the only thing that you have to worry about is the is the din bolt or the yoke bolt where seawater percolates along those threads and it needs removal, washing and replacement once a year, even if it does give you a three-year service interval, that at least ought to come off every year. You better get away while you can. Just give me something to talk about and I'll bullshit you for a while. Oh, you know, the, that's the, I think the conch shelf surprises me. I, I don't know why, why it's so popular uh, because uh, it, it just, it, it's a Timex watch. It takes a lick and it keeps on ticking. I, I'll grant you that. Um, you can see the whole mechanism right, right there. Uh, which side has the volcano? There's the volcano on this side. So you can see the volcano. You can see the pin that's being driven, and uh, and this balance chamber um, is just it just pops out. You just undo this uh, the circlip, and the balance chamber pops out. And you can you can buy another one from Vintage Double Hose, and it keeps working forever. But it does depend on that little hole down the middle of the poppet for balancing. There's no accessory pathway in this guy, so it's a workhorse. But it's very primitive, and uh, I've never really understood quite why they're so popular, but they do they do keep working uh, as long as you don't ding that that volcano. Uh, so nothing metal ever goes in the top end uh, of a regulator for me, or especially a diaphragm. That's all I got. That's all I got. Thank you all. I appreciate you coming by, and uh, and we'll uh, actually is there, is there something else that we we should do a you know we should do a little session on sometime? Um, what other topics?
E250 versus S600, something in that realm, the second stages, maybe similar to this. E250 versus the S600, sure, sure, that would that would be kind of fun. And actually, that would be a good. I hate doing this because I'm not a Scoob Bowl fanboy, but I have to admit I got introduced to the S270 at my last uh, technician seminar uh, with Renee. And the S270 is a plastic version of the S620 Ti. Um, it has uh, the same poppet internals. It has everything but the titanium barrel. It's got that small case. This Scoop Pro has done some good things recently, and, which is why I like the uh, the 350. They've also done some stupid things. But but uh, if we talk about regulators that you love, high up on my list is the uh, is the C three fifty C three fifty is just a magical reg because it's it's got the same small case as the S six twenty it's got this um, curved uh, exhaust T piece that they experimented with with additions to the edge until they kept extending it out there. Um, for the guys that don't like bubbles near their face until this thing started to smokestack and suck air out of the regulator with free flow because of the negative pressure generated by the by the last exhalation. So they had to trim it back a little bit. But the, the point is that with the C-series and with the S620 and with the D420, they've got an exhaust valve system that although it is pretty narrow and will let bubbles go by your eye if that irritates you, uh, it also makes the exhalation work of breathing so low because it's sort of self-sucking, self-exhausting. And that's really where most of the advancements in the ANSTI numbers have been uh, made in the last decade. It's not on the inhalation side. We've got these valves down as light as we can. And the only thing that's beaten that now is the D420 that's gone back to the center pop, but center balance pop it with a really light spring. But there's nothing more you can do on the inhalation side. No, it's a it's a toilet seat. You figure out a way to lift the lid and the gas flows. So the only way to make that work of breathing loop smaller is by um, compressing the top half. The bottom half has been brought up close to zero. You, you suck and the valve opens and it's and it's very nice, but you still have to blow to exhale. So if we want to do something for the advertisers and the and the ANSTI machine, the only way you squash that down is by making exhalation easier. And that's what they've done with the D420. It's what they did with the S620 and with the C-Series. What I like about this, the C-Series is, uh, is the lever. The, uh, the, uh, the lever in this puppy is reminiscent of the, of the dragon regulator of in School of Pro's history, the Darth Vader X650. The X650 was an absolute disaster because it was a high friction piece of shit that just deserved every bad thing that was said about it. And unfortunately, it was engineered to look like the D-series, so it had that, that Darth Vader look to it. But it also had this lever in it. This lever replaced the standard um, fork lever that's balanced on both sides with this side, this side action rod. And from an engineering standpoint, that was a great idea in the 650. It was just executed very badly. Well, they fixed it here. This, this regulator, let's see if I can uh, zoom in on it. Um, this regulator has uh, an extremely low friction hinge right there. It's got a perfectly round uh, shape to it. It fits through the uh, poppet in a square boss that engages perfectly and doesn't slip out like the occasional legs of, a, of an old-fashioned lever. And because its point of contact with the back of the diaphragm disc is so uh, small uh, and so polished and so nicely rounded, the initiation effort and inhalation effort uh, is, is extremely low friction. The downside to this, of course, is as a downstream regulator, it's got a bigger spring. Uh, so it's subject to the same penalty that any downstream rig has if you lose IP because your first stage is, is not acting well. 
uh, then it, it gets hard to suck this valve open. Uh, it also means that the seat deteriorates a little faster because you've got these spring pressures pushing on it. But the thing that I like about it is that this reg is dirt simple. This reg will never kill me. It can get full of grit, full of sand, and it's just a toilet seat. You lift the lever and it opens it. You let it go and it closes it. On top of that, there was another factor here. And I don't know if I can demonstrate it for you without taking this apart. But the fascinating thing about the C350 series was uh, that the poppet was unique uh, in Scuba Pro's history. Uh, and it's worth watching just to see this because it... Uh, Okay, I'm going to rotate this barrel just a little bit and turn it 90 degrees and pull out the lever. It's supposed to be easier than this. I'm not looking like Rene Dupre today. But I want to show you this poppet. It's so cool. Okay, there it comes. So this one, this falls out. Look at this poppet. What's different about this poppet compared with the classic uh, S-wing poppet that's in the 620 and every school pro regulator from the balance adjustable all the way up through the present day? Uh, let's see if I've got one somewhere. <coughs> when you look at the S-wing poppet right here, Compare it with this one. Where's the spring? On the S-wing poppet, got a lot of junk in the way here, don't I? Let's see if I can clear a little room here. On the S-wing poppet, the spring is there. So when the valve opens, gas starts flowing around the seat and down along the poppet. It's got to go through the spring before it comes out the hole in the barrel. It's just a lot of trash in the way. And with the C350, they cleaned that up. So now it goes past this poppet and it goes straight out the mouthpiece with nothing but smoothness in between here and there. It has huge inspiratory flow. In fact, when I had this reg attached to my regulators for demo purposes and I was doing brisk purges, the, the venturi was so strong without a mouthpiece that it was slamming the, <laughs> the diaphragm open. I could hear it go and, and hit the hit the the base of the regulator um, because it was, the Venturi effort was so so strong. So I actually had to turn the Venturi uh, to a detuned position, to the pre-dive position for, for a purging without the mouthpiece. It's just tremendous flows. It's a, it's a, it's a great regulator. This also has this huge, huge um, uh, exhalation uh, pathway, which they then had to detune uh, to make it work. And so they put these gates on there and these gates open and close in a very precise fashion. Now, you got to love school pro engineers. They're, they're lousy in terms of customer uh, relations. They're just really arrogant, but man, their engineers are, are pretty damn cool. So this is my favorite downstream regulator in the world. Uh, they're very hard to find. They're not manufactured anymore. You see them on eBay, snap up a C350 because they still make the kits. And this thing breathes like a banshee and, and doesn't have the one thing that worries me about, uh, about our complex regs. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't prepare for a second stage discussion. Well, the, the balance chamber, balance chamber that fits on the end of this and provides that back pressure because it comes down the hole in the middle and pressurizes the, the balance chamber so now it pushes the poppet close and helps the spring so that the spring can be much lighter than it is in in most regulators that balance chamber is a good place for grit to collect and if it catches then your poppet motion is going to get uh, impeded and that's the only thing that worries me about diving in the worst conditions if you're down muck diving taking pictures in the sand or in a cave or whatever diving with a, a balanced uh, uh, second stage, like the S620 Ti, like the G250, like the, balance, the BA109, um, they all have that potential flaw if you get grit in there. How often does that happen? You know, almost never. 
But if you want something that'll keep you alive no matter what, it's a downstream valve. Um, but yeah, we should do we should do an S620 uh, versus 250 comparison because we can talk about um, what the presence or absence of the micro adjuster does for you as a diver. Uh, the short answer is it doesn't do anything. It sure is great for the technician though uh, to be able to fine tune your rig. Because the one downside of the G250 is that once you put your spring in, once you back the adjustment knob all the way out, that compression is fixed. You can't get any lower in IP than you than you have right there. Um, I, I guess you could sand the back of the balance chamber so it could go out a little bit further, but but that'd be the only thing I could think of to take the load off of this spring. Uh, conversely, uh, G260 um, has that micro adjust in it. The S620 Ti has the micro adjust in it so that now the spring is preloaded with the knob out all the way. But if you want it an even lighter uh, cracking effort, you just come out on the uh, on the uh, micro adjust. So, hey, Robert, how are you? I heard you for a second. Sorry, I was a cat. I thought I was on mute. Oh, that's all right. Rob, it's Rob. Jacoby here. I would love to see, have one of these, maybe it's too narrow a, a topic. I would love to have one of these sessions on the center balance poppets. As you know, you got me going, uh, servicing my own D-series Air Ones. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of t at the advanced intermediate stage, but the problematic uh, regs, I... I just don't get them, some of them. So I'd sure. love to see one of those. And I now have a 420, which I've taken apart and put back together. But uh, I'd love to yeah, have that'll uh, be a, that'll be a smaller uh, a smaller audience than we had for tonight. <laughs> this is uh, this is yeah. an impressive uh, collection of folks. I want to thank you all for for uh, spending your dinner time with me. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, a D series or center balance series uh, discussion would be a small audience, but I'd love to do it because that it's it is my favorite regulator in the whole world. I've got or D regulators and I know what to do with, you know, the, the, uh, the D 400 would be the last version of the, of the old guard. And, uh, and the uh, D 420, the first version of the, of the new, the new crowd. And, and uh, they, they are, they have the same valve in them, but everything else is very different. And scuba Bo made some interesting choices there that all revolve around case geometry that might be another good discussion too is case geometry fault what that means to you as a diver because it is significant when i uh when my d420 first arrived and we were all asking questions about how it performed i took uh, a mark 25 i confess and put a regulator on every port i had a a700 i had a d400 i had a d420 i had a gfu50 and one more on the fifth port and i just Played in the in the dive shop pool, upside down, lying on my back, face down, neutral, in the water, out of the water, uh, with all of them tuned to the same initial cracking effort around 1.1 inches, and it was interesting how differently uh, the Primo regs breathed. Um, it, I, I sold my A700 after that. It was it was it's like a wine tasting in a in a brown bag between the $150 bottle and the $30 bottle and the $7 bottle. Uh, you put a bag on it where you're not prejudiced by the label. And uh, it's it's interesting what you see. So like I say, I got rid of my A700. That's just a good piece of chrome to collect scratches. And I'll, I'll stick with my, uh, with my uh, 108s and 109s. None of mine are as shiny as Kuvalon. So Kuvalon is, is uh, he's probably going to put his video back on now and, and show us some chrome, and we're going to have chrome envy. But he's right. But those are the only chrome rigs I dive anymore. Uh, and the Aqualung con shelf combinations in, in their chrome iterations, they're they're nice, but those are unadjustable uh, downstages. That's that's as primitive as you can get, and I don't understand the uh, the appeal of those. Center balance, though, that's a that's a, a whole different uh, ball of wax, and these are much easier to service than the than their D four hundred predecessors. It's uh, yeah, it's it's good for geeks, but uh, it won't be many of you coming that night. What else should we talk about? Let's see. We got a so we got a D series plan, and we got a and we got a 
250-620 comparison. Now I'll throw in that 270 as well if I can get one from the shop. Well, there's a couple seminars. All right, we'll we'll see what comes uh, together over the next couple of months. Uh, send me a, a a direct message if you if you have another idea, and uh, and I thank you for your for your joining me. Thank you, Rob. All right, adios. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>